So welcome to our sensory webinar. This was developed by our occupational therapy team. We wanted to give you an overview of the workings of the sensory processing system and the common difficulties you might face if things aren't working as expected. And most importantly, to send you away with some strategies, useful hints and tips for you to take away and to try yourselves. You've probably found your way here as you've noticed your child finds some tasks difficult to complete. They may become irritated or overwhelmed in situations or they may be craving or seeking certain stimuli. These might be little niggles throughout the day or overwhelming problems that are taking over everything or maybe something in the middle of those. Either way, we hope that you can take some useful points away with you at the end and we can talk about further support if you need any further advice after viewing the presentation. So the main aim of the session is to explore the sensory systems and explain how they are all interacting together all the time. They affect the way we behave, our children as adults and teenagers, how they behave also. They have a really important part to play in the way we complete the tasks that we need to every day. There are so many factors that can affect behaviour, and so although we will be focusing on a sensory perspective, we do need to be mindful of other factors such as age, communication ability, developmental stage, level of learning and reaction to what's happening around us. We'll be focusing so much on the sensory perspective, but it's always really good to keep those other things in the back of our mind. Every second, our body will be taking in sensory information. It allows us to explore the world around us, keep ourselves safe and lays the foundation for a child's learning as they make sense of the world around them. Our nervous system takes in this information from our environment and delivers this to the brain. This information is then made sense of, filtered as to what is important and what is not, and then a response is formulated. A great way to think of this would be a computer analogy. We input the data into a computer using a keyboard and mouse. The computer will try and make sense and process what's being put in, and then will react to our demands. If the computer is bombarded with lots of information, it may freeze or crash. It may need time to refresh the screen. The output might not be what we'd hoped for, as it may not print out what we wanted or in the order that we desired. We all know how frustrating that can be. Ultimately, when the input isn't processed correctly, the output won't be what we expected or desired. This is the same when we have a sensory processing difficulty. We often see strong reactions to the most everyday tasks which as caregivers can take us by surprise. Self-care tasks might be faced with upset, a child may struggle to cope with or concentrate in a busy environment, or may show a strong preference for some activities over others. Or it might emerge that a child might be distracted by the littlest thing. Each on their own might be completely normal for a child's profile. For instance, lots of children don't like brushing their teeth and may grow out of this as they become more familiar and independent with the task. However, for some, this task is completely unbearable and may be clustered with other areas of difficulty, pointing to what could be sensory processing. Sensory processing difficulties can be associated with other conditions such as autism spectrum disorder or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, but it isn't always, it can just be standalone. There are certain factors that can increase the prevalence, such as a child being born prematurely, if a child has needed invasive or frequent medical intervention or long hospital stays. There could be environmental factors such as limited exposure to different stimuli or trauma where the body is frequently or continued to be exposed to stressful environments. This list is not exhaustive. So what senses do we have? We have eight in total. However, only five are more commonly spoken about and we'll familiarise ourselves with them now. We see through our eyes. This is our visual system. We smell through our nose, which is our olfactory system. We listen through our ears. This is our auditory system. We taste with our tongue, our gustatory system. We recognise touch from our skin, which is our tactile system. All affect how we interact and explore our environment. Next, we have three less well-known senses. As occupational therapists, these are the ones we tend to focus on that little bit more. So firstly, our movement, or what we call our vestibular system, is located in our inner ear. It feeds back our interaction with gravity. We are able to determine the orientation of our body and our environment when we're moving along these different planes. It's really important for maintaining balance and posture and adjusting our body position, critical for moving safely. Next is our body position, or proprioception. 
It's located really deep in our muscles and joints. Every time we move a limb, every time we move position, we get messages to our brain that tells us where our body parts are in space and in relation to our environment, thus developing our body awareness. Lastly, we have a lesser known sense which helps us understand and feel what's going on inside our body. This is interoception. Children who struggle with the interoceptive sense may have trouble knowing when they feel hungry, full, hot, cold or thirsty. Having trouble with this sense can also make self-regulation a challenge. When the millions of pieces of sensory information reach our brain, it's processed and sifted through, almost like there is a secretary that sits in the brain and decides which information is important and which messages can be ignored. If we don't get the right messages or get too many messages, it'll impact on how we do our jobs. And that's the same with sensory processing. We call this process of regulating, processing sensory information and then responding to. This is sensory modulation. The fine tuning that happens as we sift through that information allows us to turn up the volume for some information, but ignore others. For example, you're hopefully able to listen to what I'm saying while ignoring the sound of the traffic or a clock ticking in the background. When this processing goes wrong, we might get too much information or not enough which then makes it difficult to participate in daily activities. Imagine it's a really hot day and you're very thirsty. You have a small glass of water, but quickly feel that you've drank too much. You push the glass away and feel overwhelmed by it. Alternatively, you might have a really big glass of water, but it doesn't matter how much you drink, you just keep feeling thirsty and you want to drink more and more and more. If your child is oversensitive, they have a small glass. A very small amount of sensory input will make them feel overwhelmed. They will avoid that input. So for example, if they're oversensitive to noise, they might hold their hands over their ears or run away from the loud noise. If they are undersensitive, they have a large glass and won't be aware of the information that's coming in or it might take them a long time to respond to the sensation. They are likely to crave or seek more. For example, they might be undersensitive to movement and so they are constantly on the go, spinning, jumping, and generally bouncing off the walls. For all of us, we have different size glasses for each of the senses. For example, we could be undersensitive to movement, but oversensitive to touch or noise. To make it even more difficult, on days that you are feeling tired or stressed, that ability to process information is even harder, in which case makes your glass more likely to overflow, you're more likely to feel overwhelmed. Our proprioceptive system is our sense of body position. Every time we move our muscles, joints, ligaments, they send a message to our brain about where our body parts are and what they are doing. So when my alarm goes off in the morning, without opening my eyes, I am able to hit the snooze button without looking. Proprioception enables us to move smoothly and with control. If there's more resistance to movement, then this system fires more. So if you're doing an activity that involves pushing, pulling, lifting or whole body movements, big gross motor movements, then there's more information passed to the brain from this system. Proprioception can be calming or alerting. It helps to organise what's going on within the sensory system. So it helps us feel grounded and more in control, less overwhelmed. If there's difficulties, your child might appear heavy handed. So they might be the child that breaks toys or pens without meaning to or presses hard when they are writing. They may have poor body awareness, so fall over nothing, or bump into things and are constantly covered in bruises from bumping into objects. You might have poor spatial awareness in relation to others, so you might crash into other children in the playground. If they are seeking more, they'll be very fidgety and very active and on the go. The vestibular system gets information from the inner ear. Within the inner ear are semicircular canals. They are like fluid-filled hoops that are held at different angles. As we move our head, the fluid within these hoops move, sending sensory messages to the brain about movement, change of direction and the change of head position. For most people, fast movement and lots of change of direction increases alertness, whereas slow movement in one direction, such as rocking or slow swinging, are more calming to the nervous system. A good way of thinking about this is to think about a spinning fairground ride. You're unlikely to want to fall asleep just after getting off a spinning fairground ride. You're more likely to feel pumped up and ready to dance. Equally, a rocking chair or a gentle swinging hammock is less likely to make you feel like you want to get up and dance. You're probably more likely to feel calm and relaxed. 
On the slide, you can see a child hanging upside down off a climbing frame. We often see that children hold this position. They hang upside down off the edge of a settee, or hang upside down when they're playing. Hanging upside down and having their head in the upside down position can be incredibly regulating and organising for the sensory system. So if your child is the child that hangs upside down off the city or climbing frame, know that they're giving themselves some lovely sensory input when they're doing so. If your child has vestibular difficulties, you might see some of the following examples. If they're oversensitive, so remember if they've got a quite small glass, they don't need much movement sensation before they feel overwhelmed. They might avoid movement and avoid changing their head position. They may get upset and cry with movement. They might avoid play and exploring or might feel nauseous and complain of headaches after movement. If they're undersensitive, so they've got a big glass, they need lots of movement but struggle to register the movement. You might find a child is more of a risk-taking child, so they've got very high activity level. They are on the go all the time. There's lots of spinning, jumping and hanging upside down as they try and fill up that glass and get as much information as they can from their vestibular system. The tactile system uses receptors from the skin and mouth to get sensory information. It works along two different pathways in our nervous system. The protective pathway allows us to identify pain, temperature, tickle and light touch. The protective pathway allows touch information to be sent very quickly to the brain it enables a protective response often before we are even aware. For example, if you touch a hot radiator, you don't have to think, oh, it's hot, I'll move my hand. You move your hand automatically. Then afterwards, you think about how hot it was and whether you've hurt yourself. The other tactile pathway is the discriminative system. It's the system I'm using when I put my hand in my handbag to feel for my car keys. I can feel the difference in the texture and the size and temperature of objects so I can tell the difference between my keys and my purse. It's also the system that allows me to feel vibration or touch pressure. The discriminative system inhibits, so it controls or dampens down the protective system. For example, if you've got an itchy mosquito bite, you dull down that horrible tickly sensation by scratching. We are naturally drawn to use our discriminative system to help calm it down. When your child has hurt themselves and you tell them to rub it better, we are encouraging them to reduce the pain, their protective system, by using firm touch pressure, their discriminative system. For most people, light tickly touch or unexpected touch is alerting for the nervous system and deep pressure touch is more calming. For example, light tickly touch, such as the feeling of an insect landing on your skin, automatically alerts you but the firm pressure from a massage makes you feel calmer. If a child is undersensitive to touch, so they have a large glass, it doesn't matter how much information is going in, they struggle to register it. They may seek more tactile input, and so behaviours you might see are lots of fidgeting or touching other people or objects in the environment, lots of mouthing or chewing actions, or you might see biting, pinching or rubbing. They may have a reduced response to pain or temperature and so do not realise that they've been hurt or complain when they've fallen over. If the child is oversensitive to touch, they've got a small glass that overflows quickly. You might see difficulties with how they process information, so any unexpected or light touch can be perceived as pain. This can cause a child's nervous system to react as though they are under threat and cause automatic responses such as running away, hiding, freezing, or hitting out at others. A child that someone has brushed against when walking past may respond by hitting. Children who are oversensitive to touch avoid messy play. They are likely to have difficulties with getting dressed and struggle with the sensation of clothing. So you might find that they only accept wearing certain textures and complain about seams on their socks or labels on the back of their clothes. Busy environments are likely to make your child feel very anxious or stressed. Self-care activities involve lots of touch, so your child is likely to have difficulty with any hair or teeth care and difficulties with bathing or showering. You can be over or under sensitive in other areas of the sensory system. For example, your child might not notice the detail of the world or struggle to know what to attend to. They may be overwhelmed when there's too much visual information. For example, supermarket shopping can be an issue or they might struggle when the Christmas decorations go up. 
you might notice that your child is distracted by every detail of little things in their environment or misses everything that's going on. If there is difficulty processing auditory information, noises from the environment, these children are often more anxious. Unexpected sounds can overstimulate and overwhelm the nervous system. Sounds in our environment can't be controlled. We can't say, I'm walking to school today, please don't mow your lawn, and I don't want any noisy motorbikes driving past. This can make the child feel anxious as their sensory system is waiting for that unexpected sound. Often, children who have difficulties with auditory processing are often the noisiest children in the house. And that's because if you make lots of noise yourself, you can drown out all the noises in the environment. Quite often, children who have difficulties with auditory processing have repeated hearing tests. As they miss sounds from the environment, people often think they've got hearing difficulties when the difficulty is how they process sounds. They may have difficulty following classroom instructions as they struggle to identify the teacher's voice from other noises or voices in the classroom. Smells have a very strong link to memory and so smells can evoke experiences that you've had previously. So for example, certain baking smells remind me of baking with my mum as a child or the smell of cut grass can remind me of a happy childhood days playing outside. The link to memories can either be good or bad memories. So if your child has a strong reaction to a smell, it might be they smelt the smell when they are undergoing a particularly unpleasant experience. So it might be a memory, not sensory driven. Tastes and smells are protective. They are there to keep us safe. So for example, if there was a glass of clear fluid, I would use my smell to identify what was in the glass and would not be tempted to try it if I didn't like the smell. Sensitivities around taste and smell can link to our food choices and the comfort that we find from food. Your child might prefer crunchy foods and dislike food that are more unpredictable, like yogurts with fruit or mashed potato, because both might have unexpected lumps and so lack texture consistency. However, food choices might be because they struggle to cope with stronger smelling food and prefer bland tastes, or they may smell everything in their environment and seek out strong or sour tastes. Your child may overfill or stuff their mouth while eating, which might be an attempt to gain more sensory input to their tactile and proprioceptive systems, but can lead to increased risk of choking. Equally, if your child doesn't process temperature effectively, they might take a large gulp of hot tea or turn the hot tap on and scold themselves when having a bath. So differences in sensitivities may mean that you need to be more aware of safety. So what can you do to help if your child has sensory processing difficulties? The first thing is to increase your knowledge, which is why you're here listening to this workshop. The next step is to increase your self-awareness of how you and your child process sensory information. It's important that you understand how your own sensory system operates. Are you oversensitive to sound? Remember, if you're oversensitive, you have a small glass, which quickly overfills with only a small amount of sensory input. What do you do to feel regulated? Do you find a quiet space to have a hot drink or do you go for a run? Perhaps you turn the music up loud and dance. If you want to support your child to feel regulated, you need to be calm and regulated yourself to do so. Parenting is tough, but it's so much harder if you have a child with sensory processing difficulties. So the first step you need to take is to understand and know how to regulate your own sensory system. Recognise what sensory tools you have to feel calm and regulated and allow yourself time to use them. On the website, we have provided a link to a booklet which was written by occupational therapists from Falkirk called Making Sense of Your Sensory Behaviour, which we recommend you read. The next thing to do is to become a sensory detective. You need to step back and look at what your child does. What activities is your child struggling with? Do they struggle with getting dressed, brushing their teeth, or maybe noisy or busy environments are distressing? What sensory systems are involved before and during the activity? What does your child do when they are calming themselves? Do they chew on their water bottle, rock backwards and forwards on their feet, or just want a big hug from you? What do they do when they feel calm and happy? Do they lay on the floor? Do they jump up and down or hang upside down on the edge of the city? Standing back and thinking about what sensory systems are involved during these activities will begin to give us clues to understand what is happening. A child's brain is developing until they are 25 years old. So as well as developing language and motor skills, their emotions and sensory processing skills are also developing. 
Because they are children, and especially if they have poor interoception, which is the ability to process feelings from inside our body, they may not recognise changes from within their body, such as feeling anxious or angry. We need to recognise changes within our own body before we use tools to help us feel more regulated. Starting to name an emotion and linking it back to what you think might have caused it will help raise a child's awareness. You can do this for yourself as well as your child. For example, you may say, I have a funny feeling in my tummy because I'm nervous about my job interview today. Or you might say, your fists are clenched and you are shouting. I think you're angry because your sister took the toy you wanted to play with. We can then begin to make changes to activities to help your child to self-regulate. We might encourage activities which provide proprioception. For example, activities that have a resistance to movement, such as push, pull, carry or climb, or use full body movements, such as playing outside or riding a bike. We could make changes to the environment, such as reducing background noise by turning the television off or reducing the brightness of the lights by turning lights off or using a lower wattage bulb with warm shades. Finally, we could modify the activity, such as using unflavoured toothpaste, bathing instead of using the shower, or buy a sweatshirt instead of a knitted jumper. In our second workshop, we will go into more detail about how you can do these things practically during activities. This section of the video focuses on the practical things that you can do at home to help your child organise their sensory system. We've talked about the theory of sensory processing, how our different senses interact with each other and the different behaviours you might see if the senses aren't doing or working quite as they should. So when thinking of the different senses, consider the home environment. Consider the visual stimuli you have at home. If you are trying to calm things down, then simple things such as drawing the curtains, dimming the lights, lowering lamps onto the floor, reducing or hiding clutter will all help. Think about the amount of noise going on in the house. Is there a way of reducing it? Sometimes our own voices can be too loud or excitable at times, so try to be aware of this. Think about the volume, tone and speed of how you speak. Try keeping sentences short and simple. Crouch down to your child's level to gain their attention rather than shouting from the kitchen, for example. Particularly, consider your child's bedroom. This room ideally needs to be the quiet, safe space for when they need a sensory break and for winding down for bedtime. It can be extra challenging if your child shares a room with a sibling, but try to offer a small, quiet space somewhere in the house, such as a little pop-up tent with some blankets thrown over, a large cardboard box, or even a space under your child's bed if it's big enough. Think about your child's bedding. Does your child like to be wrapped up nice and snug? Do they like the feeling of a little weight or pressure? Maybe they like to have nothing on them at all. Try a range of options to find out what your child prefers. Some possible ideas might be blankets with the edges tucked under the mattress, lycra bed sheets, soft toys or cushions piled over your child's legs and sleeping bags, rectangular shaped or mummy style. Your child might prefer things to be quiet or maybe gentle background noise like white noise. You could also try some calming soundtracks from your music provider. Dimmable lights are generally good for bedrooms, but again, some children may prefer no light at all or just a very soft night light. Find out what your child's preferences are. Be careful of lights which project up onto the ceiling and move around. These can be calming for some, but for others it can be too stimulating. We know that deep touch or heavy pressure helps to calm and organise the sensory system, so encourage floor play. Where your child might lie on their tummies, sides or backs. This gives them much more contact from the floor through their bodies, which might be more organising for them than sitting on a chair. Activities which offer a feeling of deep touch might be giving your child a bear hug, or if they're not keen on this, encouraging to give themselves one. Maybe your child quite likes to wrap themselves up in a blanket. Some children love the feeling of weighted items. Weighted blankets work for some children, but please do be aware that there are safety guidelines for using these and be particularly cautious if your child is not physically very mobile. Your child should be able to easily and independently remove the weighted blanket and it should never go over their heads. During the day, encourage your child to actively engage in deep pressure type activities such as carrying, pulling, dragging, lifting, climbing and crawling. For example, 
Get your child to help you unload the washing machine. Help you carry the washing basket or the shopping. Maybe get them to help in the garden. Push a wheelbarrow or a broom around, fill a bucket with soil and then tip it to make a mud castle. Movement is another important stimulus that can really impact our nervous systems. Movement, which is predictable and linear, generally calms, whereas fast, spinning or sudden changes of direction will excite the nervous system. Indoor children's swings, garden swings and hammocks can provide a calming and organising movement sensation at home. You could also try encouraging your child to lie on their tummies over a large yoga ball. Encourage them to slowly push off from their feet forward onto their hands and back again, while you control the speed by gently pressing down with your hands through their upper body. Some children love the feeling of gently being squashed by a yoga ball. You could try encouraging your child to lie on their tummies on the floor, then slowly roll the yoga ball down their bodies, starting from their shoulders and down to their feet. Be sure to ask your child how firmly they want you to press down on the ball as you roll it along. Then once you get to your child's feet, Lift the ball and place it firmly back on your child's shoulders and go again. When thinking about ideas for calming and organising, we must think of all our senses, so smells and flavours also come into this. For example, warm, sweet and chewy foods tend to be calming, compared to crunchy, spicy or icy cold foods. Smells such as mint, eucalyptus, coffee and citrus tend to alert the nervous system, whereas smells like rose, lavender, chocolate and vanilla tend to calm. Find out what your child likes and doesn't like. For example, if your child can't cope with the smell of mint, then a different flavour or even a flavourless toothpaste might be helpful. Non-foaming toothpastes are available too, which some children cope much better with. So far, we have focused mainly on the child who needs calming input. So the child who struggles to sit still, finds it hard to focus, maybe is quite highly strung and is always on the go and very active. But what about the child who might need moving from a low energy state to a more alert, focused zone? For these children, activities which provide fast and stop-start kind of input might help. How we communicate can also impact on our children. We talked earlier about lessening our voice volume and talking more slowly. But for the child who needs alerting, then you might want to try being a bit more animated, perhaps using bigger gestures and facial expressions as well. Give the same thought to your child's environment. Brighter lights, or perhaps lights which change colour or move, might help your child feel more regulated when it's time to get up. Music or sounds which are fast with a strong beat will help alert. Crunchy foods will be more alerting than chewy foods and so on. In terms of touch sensations, light, tickly or spiky touch will alert the nervous system. So if safe, you could try offering your child a touchy-feely bag containing a selection of items which provide these kinds of stimuli. Things like couche balls, fluffy or feathery items, vibrating cat toys, spiky pine cones, hair rollers or dry sponges. Whether your child needs calming or alerting input, and some might need a mixture of both, engaging in proprioceptive activities, activities which provide firm, steady pressure through the body, will help achieve both goals. How does this work and what might it look like in practice? Perhaps your child seems like sometimes they need help calming down and other times they need to be revved up. Perhaps you have more than one child and you're struggling to manage different sensory needs under one roof. Or what about the classroom environment when there may be 30 or so children with a wide range of sensory profiles? You may be wondering which type of sensory input you should try and focus on. The thing to remember is that you can't go wrong with proprioceptive activities. Proprioception, which is our body awareness sense, is closely linked to our ability to regulate ourselves or to be in that just right zone. Whether we are too high or too low, the main difference is that heavy work activities, which are done in a slow, steady kind of way, generally calm down the more excited system, whereas activities done in a fast stop-start way generally excite the nervous system. So for a child with a mixed profile, you may need to think of a mix of these activities. Or the other way to think about it is, if your child has been engaging in some prolonged fast stop start activity, but you need them to come sit down for their dinner soon, it would probably be helpful to get them to engage in 10 minutes of slow, steady, resistive style activities to help bring them down from that high zone 
to help them to be calm enough to sit down for their meal. It's important to say here that when thinking about meal times or any sitting down activity, when you want your child to sit at a table and do something, it is really important to get their positioning right. They need to have their feet flat, either on the floor or on a sturdy box, and the table must be at the right height for them. If you don't get this bit right, before you even begin, you will be at a huge disadvantage because we know that children can lose a huge amount of focus just from maintaining their balance if they are not properly grounded when seated. As much as possible, try and encourage lots of heavy work activities throughout your child's day. Activities where your child is actively physically engaged, such as carrying, pushing, pulling, dragging, lifting, as well as crawling, climbing and rolling, will really help your child regulate their nervous system. This can also be done within the classroom using a whole class approach, as all the children will benefit, not just those with the sensory differences. The more passive activities, the things done to your child, like your child lying under the weight of the sofa cushions, or maybe enjoying being wrapped in a blanket, or swinging gently in a hammock, or being gently squashed by the yoga ball. These can be really helpful to incorporate as part of your wind down routine before bed or maybe to help your child calm down after being at school or nursery, or perhaps if they have had a meltdown and need to come back to a regulated state. For children, chewing and mouthing on non-food items can be a way of them trying to gain that proprioceptive input. Putting pressure through your teeth and gums can feel really nice to many. It's why some adults enjoy chewing gum. Perhaps your child constantly chews on their school water bottle or on their sleeves or collar or maybe pick up items like the remote control or hard plastic toys and enjoy chewing down on these. Offering your child alternative, safe options to chew on is always a good idea. Sensory chewing toys are widely available to buy. However, constant, repetitive or frantic kind of chewing tends to be a sign that a sensory need is not being met. So make sure that you give your child lots and lots of heavy pressure activities throughout their day to give them the proprioceptive fix their sensory system is likely craving. It's important to say here that if your child is a young toddler or is developmentally at that stage, then mouthing on non-food items is a normal developmental stage and not a sensory dysfunction. Where this behaviour continues to happen when the child is developmentally well past this stage though, then it can be a sensory need which your child may need help with. We are coming toward the end of this video and we want to leave you with as many ideas as possible for you to have fun experimenting with. There are lots of ideas and activities shown here which we know have worked for many families, but it is a case of trying things and finding out what works for your child based on their developmental level and what they find motivating. We certainly found that music can be really helpful for some children. You can opt for calming types of music or sounds for the child who is overly active or opt for music with a faster, stronger beat to help motivate a child who is perhaps a little bit more low energy. Try encouraging your child to wear a backpack on both shoulders. Get them to help you pack the bag with a few favourite toys, perhaps a drinks bottle too, to help give it some weight. This is an easy way to give your child some proprioceptive input while you walk to school or the park, for example. Family activities like going for a walk together can be made even more proprioceptive by encouraging your child to climb up onto and off things, collecting sticks to make a den or carrying their backpack to fill with treasures such as pine cones and interesting stones. Other ideas might be digging in the garden, pushing a wheelbarrow, raking up leaves, sweeping with a broom, carrying the basket of wet washing or helping to bring the shopping in. Family bike rides and going swimming are all very proprioceptive activities and after school activities such as martial arts, kickboxing, gymnastics, dance and horse riding are all great activities to help give that proprioceptive fix. Most children find slow movement calming. Try to incorporate this into your child's day if you can. Most parks, although they do give you movement sensation, tend to give it in a way which is very exciting rather than calming. So although swinging slowly to and fro on the park swings might work for some, for many children, just the fact that the park swing means their feet are off the floor and the only part of their body which is grounded or making contact with something solid is the narrow seat of the swing doesn't work for them. Some parks have swings which are large and circular for children to lie their whole body in, 
and these can work really well for calming sensation. You could try a lycra sack style swing for use indoors, or if you're lucky enough to have a garden, try an oversized hammock, the one which have lots of floppy material rather than the taut ones. Suspended egg chairs come in all different styles for both indoors and out, and all different budget ranges. If your child is little and you have two fairly fit adults and a sturdy blanket, you could rock your child to and fro gently between you. A simple game of row your boat played on the floor with your feet pressed against your child's and with the adult making themselves a bit heavy to move will provide both calming movement sensation as well as the proprioceptive fix. For those children who like to chew on non-food objects, in addition to all the activities we've talked about, try adding in some extra outlets for that sensory need. For example, sucking through a straw or from a sports bottle will give your child much more input into their mouth than just taking a sip from a cup, if your child is able to do this safely. The thicker the liquid, the harder they will have to suck, and the more proprioceptive feedback your child will then receive. You could also try blowing bubbles into water through a straw, blowing bubbles through a bubble wand, and you could also buy whistle-blowing sensory kits online. Chewy foods tend to be calm as opposed to crunchy foods, which tend to wake up the mouth. So again, experiment with this, within the limits of what your child is happy and safe to eat. Some final ideas for you to try. Exploring the different scents and smells is something we talked about earlier, but you can really have some fun doing this with your child to find out what they like and don't like. If your child is able to, encourage them to choose smells which help them feel calm and cosy or lively and invigorated. And then, once you have a little selection, try incorporating them into your child's daily routines. Use the calming smells around bedtime or when you need the child to be more focused and still and the lively smells for those children who may need a little help feeling awake or alert. Play-Doh can also be an underrated activity, which can provide a good fix of proprioceptive input. It is a tactile activity, and there is also an element of smell. You can make your own Play-Doh and add your own scents if your child doesn't like the smell of shop-bought Play-Doh. Play-Doh is a lovely proprioceptive activity because it's resistive in your hands, and your child has to use the muscles in their hands and arms to squash and press it down. Using different Play-Doh tools can increase the proprioceptive feedback. For example, pressing the plungers down on hair growing Play-Doh kits is not only great fun, but it requires a bit of physical pressure to press them down. If your child enjoys this type of play, it can be a nice activity to do before bedtime as part of the winding down process. Finally, we've talked previously about the value of providing a calm space somewhere in the home. When children are overwhelmed, having a space like this to retreat can also be invaluable for them. Remember, a calm space can be quite simple in design. The key is to provide an enclosed and safe environment, perhaps with a favourite soft blanket or cushion and calm lighting. This is a safe place your child can go to when they need to recharge their sensory batteries or need some time to feel calm again. As therapists, we also recommend to schools that where possible, they have a calm space available within the classroom environment for children to access when they need a sensory break. This isn't an opt-out from doing work. The work still needs to be completed on the child's return, and some children might require a visual timer to help them structure the amount of time they want to spend there. Ideally, we would want the child to access this setup before they become overwhelmed. So for younger children, it does require an adult to try and keep tabs on the child throughout their day and pick up on any signs that this child's sensory cup is getting close to spilling over. And, of course, this is not always easy and some children don't give much away. For older children, we want to help them begin to recognise within themselves when they start to feel overwhelmed so that they can start to become proactive in managing their own sensory needs. Of course, this isn't possible for all children and will depend hugely on your child's age, developmental level and communication skills. So we have reached the end of the video and we hope that you have found some ideas to take away and try. Please do come back to this video now and again as there is a lot of information here and it can be useful to give you a reminder for things to try. Now you have watched the video, you have the option of contacting our service to book onto our live webinars. These are run virtually with up to two occupational therapists and a small group of parents. The webinar gives you the opportunity to talk to us in person and ask us anything you feel that you would like to know more about. 
or perhaps you have a specific sensory-based issue you would like further support around. Parents have shared with us that they've also found it quite reassuring to listen to other parents in similar situations to them. And it's nice not to feel quite so alone when things aren't going to plan. It's absolutely not obligatory to book onto this webinar. You may feel that you have all the information you need at this time just from the video. And should you feel that you'd like to talk to an OT in the future about sensory-based issues, you can also book an advice line telephone call with us and you can access this service right up until your child is 18 years old. Schools can also access this service as long as they have your consent. We really hope that you have found this video helpful and you have some ideas to take away to start trying today. We wish you and your child all the best for the future and perhaps we will see you at one of our webinars. Thank you so much for your time.